Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Rachel Morton. I'm Professor of Health Economics at the NHMRC Clinical Trial Centre at the University of Sydney and uh, have been uh, delighted to be able to uh, co-chair um, the ACTA Heat Special Interest Group for health economists working alongside trials uh, for the last couple of years with uh, Richard Norman. And we'll be very pleased also to hand the baton over to uh, Lisa Higgins, who's our incoming uh, co-chair. Uh, I'd like to start by acknowledging uh, traditional custodians. Uh, for me, I'm dialing in from the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay my uh, respects to elders past and present and any Indigenous people who are with us today uh, across the different lands of Australia. Our uh, guest today for the seminar uh, is a health economist and director of FEMA Consulting and in his role at FEMA, uh, he's been responsible for the preparation and delivery of several hundred reimbursement applications to bodies like PBAC, MSAC and international health technology agencies. Uh, he has a particular interest in helping optimise clinical trial design to improve reimbursement decision making and outcomes for patients, for decision makers and sponsors. Uh, so it's with great pleasure that I introduce uh, Dominic Tilden, who's going to talk to us about some of those optimizations and challenges. Uh, thanks very much, Dom. Uh, we'll reserve questions uh, until the end of your presentation. And for people on WebEx, there is a Q&A function in the bottom right hand section and you can put in your Q&A there. Or if you'd like at the end, uh, come on to camera and ask your question directly. Thank you and welcome, Dominic. Uh, thanks. <clears throat> thanks. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me. I think um, we'll see how it goes. I hope, <laughs> I hope everybody uh, enjoys this. But um, let me um, get started by sharing the screen. Uh, this is going to work, I think. That's all OK. Oh, now I'm going to hit that button as well. Now I've lost everyone. Sorry. Yeah, no, that's good, uh, good. Dominic. I good. can see that. Yep. Thank you. Excellent. Well, thanks. Like I said, thanks very much for having me. Um, as uh, Rachel said, this is uh, my main background in health economics is is associated with getting drugs reimbursed, getting devices reimbursed, getting medical services reimbursed. So, you know, in the language of health economists, you know, getting al resources allocated to to these interventions. So this clinical trial design is definitely not my specific um, area of expertise, um, but <clears throat> um, as I um, allude to there in bold, but you know, in in the job that I do, you know, I obviously do get exposed to what payers want and need from clinical trials, and um, and how successful we as health economists. And I think it. I'd, I'm sure there's not just health economists online, but I know there's a handful of you. You know, um, some experience of how successful we are at at overcoming these issues with, with clinical trial design. So that's essentially what I um I want to talk talk to you about today. Um, so yeah, I'll, this is sort of my agenda for the day. About what we'll go through, um, I'll, I'll go through a few background and disclaimers, and just a bit of a refresh on what you know. Where, what the starting point is, you know, what we actually want from health economic evaluation and how we use clinical trials um, to inform that. And then I'm just going to go through a bit of a potted history, a whirlwind tour of various issues that um, I've come across in, in the kind of reimbursement applications that we've put together. And for each one of those issues, I'm, I'm going to present some real world case studies because it just makes my life easier to, to explain the, the concepts, but also hopefully makes it a bit more real and easier for you guys to, to understand. And um, then I'll sort of start to talk about, you know, what, what would be a gold standard or optimal clinical trial design. Um, so why me? Like I said, this is not my area of expertise, but um, when when I sort of started in the, the ACTA Health Economics alongside Clinical Trial Special Interest Group, um, we were asked, you know, what kind of things do we want to learn more about? What do we want to know from this group and, and so on? And one of the things that I mentioned was 
was talking about optimal trial design because a lot of time one of those committee meetings or interest group meetings we were having was you know there'd be this problem with the clinical trial and then we'd have this fix for the economics and everything would be all right i think i just stuck in my head that you know it's not always everything is not always all right and sometimes clinical trial design we're better off getting it right in the first place and relying on the um, health economic fixes so then i made the mistake of missing a meeting and i'd been volunteered in to do to do rachel had volunteered me in to do this talk on on um, clinical trial design and getting to these issues earlier so i asked why me and they said because you expressed an interest in it i said okay <laughs> but then it's it's been good because it's forced me to think a bit more um clearly about what it is about clinical trial design that i think we can improve for the purposes of um, health economic evaluation so <clears throat> onto my disclaimers you know it's very very easy to identify where things have gone wrong it's a lot harder to make them right so i'm definitely not purporting to say that i would design a perfect clinical trial by by no means so definitely take my comments with a grain of salt but what I do want, and they, like I say there, there's trade-offs. I could just, there's trade-offs for every decision that we would make. We know that as economists, and there's, this is this is no different here. Um, but what I do want to sort of try and bring to the surface is that, is to bring those trade-offs to the surface, really, to say, if we make this decision in the, in the design of the clinical trial, this is a potential consequence. This is the opportunity cost of that decision. And then we can, you know, that can help us make decisions about these clinical trial design design issues, um, and and so on. Um, like I said, I'm going to be presenting some presenting some real world world case studies, so there need to be quite a few um, disclaimers around those. Just want to be, I just want, I'm just bringing certain, I'm cherry picking them definitely. I just want to bring these to the surface, just as a way of illustrating the the issue that I, I want to talk about. All of it is based on information that's in the public domain. And I did work on some of them, but definitely not all of them. And I, in no way do I represent um, the sponsors of any of these of these case studies. These are just um, projects and case studies that I think um, are interesting. All right. What do we want from a, um, a health economic evaluation? Well, ultimately, we want to know how to allocate resources, that's healthcare resources. That's ultimately what all health economists want to do. How does the clinical trial inform this? I think the best way clinical trial informs this is by giving us that comparative evidence around what we're getting with the intervention and what we're giving up in the control. So what is our opportunity cost of going one way or the other? And I think that's exactly how the best purpose or the best use of a clinical trial in a in health economic valuation, or where it starts at least. You know, and then what do we want from a clinical trial? So I'm a health economist, not a clinical trialist, but I think the the evolution of clinical trials, you know, is has we want to know whether an intervention works. We want to know whether this intervention is going to be better than the alternative. Um, and that's why we've got primary endpoints, we've got hypothesis testing and so on and so forth. So I sort of picked up, you know, and how can we use this in health economic evaluation? Well, like I said, it is, it does enable us to have a good understanding of the control, what we're giving up for um, when we move to one from one intervention to the other. So I've sort of got that chicken and the egg sort of meme there for a reason, especially with the question mark next to it, because in this circumstance, I think we do know what came first. The clinical trial definitely preceded health economic evaluation in history, in um, the development of, of um, products, product develop, development, into healthcare intervention development. The clinical trial does come first. But do we need to be thinking about how the health economic considerations, because with, with the advent of health economic evaluation and, and decision making as we know it in, in a country like Australia, you know, we want to know more than just whether or not the, the drug works. We want to know well, lots of things, whether it's cost effective, in which patients, why, how, under what circumstances, and, and so on. So um, a lot of it, uh, as you're, as one of the things I've learned putting this, putting this, this presentation um, together is these so-called issues that I'm going to go through 
sort of evolve or stem from that fundamental disconnect, let's say, between what we want from a health economic evaluation about allocation of resources and what we want from the clinical trial in terms of does this intervention work? So just try and keep that in the back of your head when you, um, as we as we sort of go through through this talk. Okay, like I said, not systematic, whirlwind, cross section. My bias of various topics that I think are worthy of um, discussion is definitely not exhaustive. Um, and what I want to do with each one of these issues is sort of, you know, describe the issue, you know, understand why it arises because it sort of starts to talk about what are we giving up if we tried to fix this issue um, what we tend to do as health economists to, to resolve the issue and like I said and into those into those case studies I, I want to talk five main five main topics I've got here you know, patient selection comparative selection crossover composite endpoints and um, surrogate endpoints all right <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so Patient selection. And so what I'm talking about here is that, you know, clinical trials want to recruit patients with the greatest capacity to benefit. And so that means we, we, we tend to have selectively and select patients in trials that are not necessarily the patients that would be allocated the resources in, in clinical practice. And, and this, you know, we can be cynical about this as well as being scientific about it, but it does come from a, a good place as well in that we want the trial um, to succeed in the sense that we set primary endpoints, we want it to, well, if that's the right answer, put it that way, if the drug does work or the intervention does work, we do want the trial to succeed. Um, and we do want to sort of, I'll talk a little bit about this as, as we go on, you know, we want to get there as efficiently as possible. Um, so patient selection um, does, does help achieve, achieve this aim. But the problem we've got then as health economists is that we don't necessarily know that, you know, that's well, that that's the way the drug will impact patients in clinical practice. And then therefore that's the way resources will be allocated or spared or saved and so on uh, when used in, in clinical practice. Um, so we might do tests for treatment effect modification to say, well, if it doesn't, if it works the same within the groups we are looking at, then there's reason to believe it'll work the same. Uh, outside the group, we might we might be studying something with a particularly high incidence, a population with a particularly high incidence, again to make sure that um, that the trial is successful for if the drug works, the intervention works, um, and then we might sort of apply different absolute rates to the to the population in in practice. Um, just to get back to that point of saying it's this is. Not to not to be too cynical about this, that the blue text there was, I had this conversation only a couple of weeks ago. I was working with a clinical trial, someone that we work on clinical trial, and and that's that was exactly their point. We didn't want to have to wait twenty years to see a benefit. And me being the nasty, boring health economist said, "Well, I don't want to pay you for twenty years before um, we see a benefit." So there, again. There's that tension, that trade-off between the perfect clinical trial and the allocation of resources, which um, we'll go through. I'm, I'm hoping this is all pretty self-explanatory and, and reasonably well understood. So the example I've got here, um, and I'm, when I go through these examples, I'm going to try and resist the temptation to get too caught up in the detail of the individual condition, but hopefully give enough, enough of a flavour to... Um, to make the, the issue understood and, and the, the benefit of a real world um, case study. So hereditary angioedema, HAE, is ca characterized by these um, attacks. And the attacks can, can range from relatively mild all the way through to imminently life-threatening. And different populations might be more likely to be, have these attacks of different severity at different frequency. So you can say that straight away see the, the the health economic consequences of that. That you know, we want to allocate our resources to the patient groups that are having the most profound impact on their quality of life or their length of life. You know, the, the ones with the greatest burden of of these um of these attacks. The other thing about HAE is that it's a relatively well, it's a rare condition. So um, you know, the the patients to recruit to these trials 
don't grow on trees. So um, we we had a population here where we wanted to sort of um, direct treatment to the ones with more frequent attacks, 12 or more times within a six, six month period, um, or those that have experienced a life threatening HIV attack. Makes perfect sense from a um, health economic um, point of view. The clinical trial, however, doesn't make sense from a clinical trial point of view because very, very rare condition. Then if we further limit it to people on the, the rare end of the rare condition, we start to really struggle with um, probably with recruiting to, to these trials. Um, so, like we said, the trial couldn't help us on the base, this baseline attack rate. We had to go to, we go to external sources to try and work out the distribution of HA attacks, the, the duration and severity. And we make an assumption about, you know, the, the relative risk reduction observed in the trial to the likely population to be treated um, on, on, on the PBS or, um, and fair to say, and I know there's members of the PBAC on here today, I know Richard's there, um, you know, the PBAC understood the point of view and understand the disconnect between um, the trial and the population, uh, trial population and the population being treated, but were determined or wanted to um, ensure lanadelumab was used in this sufficiently high risk population so that it represented value for money, good allocation of resources. So what does this mean for our clinical trial design? Well, well the biggest, I, th I think the biggest problem with, with a perfect health economically designed clinical trial in this circumstance would have been recruitment. It would have been really, really, really difficult to recruit exactly this kind of population into a clinical trial. We'd be there for a for a long time and I'm not sure that would necessarily be feasible um, at all. And in the meantime, while we're recruiting that, we don't have a drug to, to treat these patients. So there's a cost there, people are still waiting. So is this kind of economic um, modeling workaround sufficient for decision-making? Well, probably in, in this circumstance, because it did ultimately um, attract um, a positive recommendation and therefore resources allocated towards it. So that's almost, that. I struggled a bit with this example, but only because it's almost the opposite of what I was saying earlier around um, patients, patient populations um, recruited to um, to be the ones with the greatest capacity to benefit. In this circumstance, it was a bit it was narrower than the um, than the the intended population. The trial was sorry the the population in practice was narrower than the trial population, but similar sort of um, uh, implications. Um, comparative selection. So this is an issue that comes up all the time for our for in our work the clinical trial does not you know is not compared to the intervention that would be re replaced in clinical practice it won't reflect our actual opportunity cost and therefore make it difficult for re resource allocation decisions so why does this happen probably if two main reasons i think and i'm sure there's more but and i, I don't know and again I, i'm out of my uh, limb here my area of expertise a lot i'm not a reg person either but the FDA does appear, maybe this is changing, I'm not sure, preference for placebo controlled trials. Um, again, I think that's related to the role of the clinical trial to establish that the treatment works in its own right. And But also, you know, clinical practice may have evolved since the design of the trial and that you know, these things happen, that's an issue that um, may not have been avoidable. So what do we do about it? We tend to use, you know, network meta-analyses, indirect comparisons, make all sorts of comparisons outside of the trial to ultimately get a, a comparison with the comparator that we're interested in. Um, the example I want to talk about here is um, uh, ofatimumab for, for multiple sclerosis. And I think um, the reason I do this, this diagram sort of points to one of the implications of this is you know, the, the um, in this example, fingolimod for multiple sclerosis was the main comparator. Um, 
and straight away the issue, no head to head trials between uh, Fatimumab and um, Fingolimod were available. So we went to indirect treatment comparisons. I'm oh, using a royal we there, by the way, it's not, not me. Um, uh, um, indirect treatment comparisons to, to sort of get this estimate of effect for Ofatimumab relative to, to Fingolimod. Problem with this kind of um, this kind of fix is things like the PBAC recognised here substantial transitivity issues. So, so by that you know, just because one drug was better than um, another drug in one trial doesn't mean the same drug will be better than a different drug in a different trial because of different populations and, and different issues across the trials and and so on, which can lead to you know what the PBAC called there an unknown amount of bias and the consequent difference between the drugs. So take this forest pot up here. I think Ophanomumab is one of these up here, might be this one here. Comparators here. Is that difference there? Is that a real effect or is it an artifact of the analysis or is it something else ent entirely? Um, the ultimately, I don't think we'll ever know because we're not going to get that randomized clinical trial between Ophanomumab and Fingolimod. So what is what are the implications of this? You know, if it means that if this is true, we, and it's not listed or resources aren't allocated because we don't know it to be true, then patients are going to miss out on the superior treatment that would otherwise be cost effective with better better quality evidence. So the question <clears throat> the clinical trialists <clears throat> have to ask themselves then is. If we had have done, or should we do a trial against Fingolimod to prove that we're better, to show that we're better, and therefore allocate more resources towards it? Um, and uh, that's a question I don't think we'll um, we'll, we'll get to know the, the answer of. The other thing, uh, the other thing about this um, this forest plot here that I'll just point out is it, it, that's true across any of these comparisons across any of these drugs, including the very best one, all the way down to the so-called very worst one. You know, at some point there, there might be a tipping point where the, the balance of evidence does outweigh um, the uncertainty you know, of the actual design of the comparison or the nature of the comparison and um, where we can potentially get these kind of bad resource or resource inefficient, inefficient allocation of resources um, as a result of, you know, Studying with the studies of the wrong comparator. Um, crossover, I think a lot of people working in this area would have come across um, uh, this issue in, in clinical trial design, um, where whereby patients originally allocated randomized to the control arm of the trial were allowed to to switch to the experimental treatment upon a cl clinical event. It's probably what I'll talk about most, but it all it happens quite frequently at the conclusion of, of the trial itself. And obviously because of this this crossover, we can't get an unbiased estimate of the of the treatment effect. Why does this issue arise? And it happens, I don't know if I mentioned this already, but it happens a lot in oncology. Or, say it happens a lot, it doesn't necessarily happen a lot, but it, where it does happen, it's most often in, in oncology, I'll say it that way, um, in my experience at least. Um, <clears throat> you know, Patients with terminal cancer, they do want the best opportunity to extend their lives, and I don't think anybody um, wants to deny them that opportunity. So those patients will will see the risk or reward of um, entering a trial, but they, you know, they want to get the good stuff. Um, so that helps with recruitment if, if it is the good stuff. But if it's not the good stuff, they don't have a lot to lose. So um, that's probably why a lot of the time why there is some crossover in, in oncology in particular. Um, otherwise, you know, patients might need an incentive. You know, we are asking a lot of patients by getting to, to go into clinical trials and, you know, what, what's in it for them, I think, is a reasonable thing to to say. And then access to the to the new intervention might be um, might be something to help recruitment. Again, this is not my area of expertise, but I can easily see that it would be easier to recruit to a trial where crossover is available than than not, regardless of the um, the implications it has for you know the the science of the experiment and the and health economic considerations later on. 
Um, a lot of times people would say it's, it's the ethical thing to do to allow crossover. Um, I, I sort of put that in italics because I, I struggle with this question because I just, I, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. Sometimes I feel as though you need the result of the trial before you know whether it's ethical to let people cross over or not. Um, I, I was at a meeting with the chair of PBOC years ago, a long, long time ago, and he taught the, the client um, mentioned that we couldn't do, do that to the trial because of ethical considerations. And and they they got into a lot of trouble. <laughs> the chair tore strips off them and sort of said, this clinical trial program was not ethical because it doesn't allow for decision making down down the track. So, I think those there's the ethical considerations between individual and population level um, are worthy of consideration as well. So, what do we what do we tend to do about um, these this crossover? So, you know, there's any number of statistical or mathematical techniques. I'm not going to bore you with all of those, but they. They definitely do exist and what they're trying to do is just trying to predict what would have happened if that is the data that's available to predict what would have happened if that crossover didn't exist we might also model surrogate endpoints unaffected by the crossover design so you know what i mean by that is often this crossover happens at the point of disease progression in in oncology can we use progression free survival as a means of predicting overall survival um, things like that and in the circumstance where the where the crossover sort of happened after the trial otherwise finished, we can maybe extrapolate the data that the controlled data that we we do have. So I've got a couple of examples here, the, and they're, they're a fair way apart in chronology. So in in two thousand and nine, this is Everolimus um, for renal cell carcinoma. Um, Basically, clinical trial, it was placebo controlled, you can sort of see there, placebo controlled. Once patients um, progressed, met this definition of progression, so the tumour started to grow again, um, they were allowed to cross over to, to um, receive the experiment, exper uh, experimental treatment, everolimus treatment, and um, therefore confounded what might have happened to overall survival. So, Whilst you can sort of see a nice benefit, unconfounded benefit in progression-free survival, in terms of overall survival, um, you, there's not much difference there at all. Now, is that entirely because of crossover or is it because progression is not a surrogate for overall survival in this, in this condition? Um, again, we will never know with this clinical trial design because, because of this um, crossover where if the drug did work in um, keeping patients alive, then it's it's working upon progression. If it isn't, we don't know the curve would still look the same, although lower. Um, so the PBAC in this circumstance, what are the implications? PBAC agreed that you know the, tr the drug did work. So again, getting back to that clinical trial, successful, the drug works. Um, but the magnitude of the benefit in terms of overall survival is is highly uncertain, and therefore um, the the treatment was not funded, resources were not allocated. So what does this mean? Well, if the treatment does save lives, then patients are denied access to a life saving treatment because we don't know if it. Um, yeah, be, yeah it, we've now lost out on a potentially life saving treatment. If it doesn't, and it was funded despite the um, crossover, then maybe they're exposed to treatment earlier that's ultimately not even doing anything for them in terms of um, their overall survival. Um, and this is sort of what I'm getting at in terms of that ethical, because either way, I don't think we've resolved any ethical considerations because we don't know if we've got a life-saving treatment and we don't know if we don't. So, um, I think that's the, the the end result is the I think you know the the introduction of crossover here has made it difficult for uh, resource allocation funding decision. So twelve years later, um, fairly similar sort of scenario. You know, oncology trial substantial crossover again sixty percent. I think exactly the same words if I'm yeah, not mistaken. Substantial crossover, substantial crossover. 
Um, you can see there quite a nice difference in terms of progression free survival. I think the biggest difference in this example, though, is that even with the crossover, you can still see something going on here in terms of um, overall survival. Um, these sort of fixes that I was referring to before, RPSFT, which I think was the one that um, the sponsor used here for this base case, um, no adjustment, IPCW, like you can sort of see that that's a pretty reasonable range in terms of what the cost effectiveness ratio could could be in the presence of this um, crossover and sort of points a little bit to the, the sort of variability in what these um, these methods um, can can provide or can deliver. So in this circumstance, the PBAC did agree that again that the PFS benefit was there and that in this circumstance was likely to correlate to an overall survival benefit. Um, although not probably more than what the trial said it would do because of the crossover, but probably less than what the sponsor wanted the PBAC to believe. So why was this why was this successful? Why was this fix? Which is basically I don't think I mentioned RPSFT was a similar method used in in, in the Everolimus submission earlier. Why was this one successful? Um, you know, maybe there is an improved understanding of the methods between 2009 and 2021. Um, maybe this, because there is still a little bit of an overall survival, this difference, by the way, was not statistically significant. Um, maybe because of there was something left that um, the PBAC were, accept, were willing, more willing to accept that there is some benefit. Um, and whilst there's a bit of a range of cost effectiveness results, you know, it could be 30% worse, it could be 26% better, maybe that range was um, tolerable. Um, but obviously I wasn't in a PBAC meeting because it could be all of the above, could be could be none of the above. But there's a, an example where we can, can fix um, the, these issues eventually. Um, starting to run out of time, I'll, I'll flick through these ones. Composite endpoints, this is a bit of a bugbear of mine as a health economist. So this is the circumstance you see a lot in cardiovascular trials where we use a, a range of individual events that can really vary from hospitalization to a minor bleed through to death. So, you know, I know which one I would prefer um, if I had a choice, but the clinical trial does not um, distinguish between those two events. Um, and again, I think this relates to the fact that, you know, the role of the clinical trial is to show that the drug works and we can do that. I keep saying the drug, sorry, the, the intervention, you know what I mean. Um, the, yeah, the, um, we can do that when we get more events, we can power it better and keep the clinical trial small. Um, so, you know, what can we do about this? Well, you know, maybe it's not too big a deal. We can. If someone dies in the trial, we can, they'll die in the model. If they only have a hospitalization in the trial, they'll only have a hospitalization in the model. That fits, you know, not, not too bad, but defeats the purpose of separating them in the first place. And we, you know, we might end up modeling differences that are not statistically significant on the individual um, uh, endpoint. Or we can go the opposite direction and say, well, once the primary endpoint is met, we can assume the same percent reduction across all those events and um, potentially be, you know, use data in our economic evaluation that's different to what was observed in the trial. Um, just digging out a, a, a case study here. Interesting thing out of this is that the PBAC just said that in this trial, the main thing that was driving the benefit for the treatment um, relative to the comparator was reduced non-fatal MIs. And PBAC argued that, you know, that marginally outweighed um, the benefit, you know, the safety profile of this particular intervention. So the decision maker relied on the individual component of the endpoint because the other, other components weren't in their own right statistically significant, you know, arguably defeating the purpose of the trial itself. You know, there's a potential here that if it, again, similar to the Everolimus circumstance, that a, a um, funded treat, a, a life-saving treatment doesn't get funded because um, of the trial design, the, the endpoint um, design. 
Um, and so would a study based on survival um, have yielded a better result for the treatment? Obviously, it's going to be a bigger trial as well, which I'll get to. Um, this is my last example, clinically irrelevant. It's a bit of a long one, so I'll, I'll flick through it pretty quickly. Um, but clinically relevant surrogate endpoints. So um, what's happening here? Uh, where you know clinical the endpoint to clinical trials are short term or use instruments that are not used in in clinical practice. Again, recurring theme: the role of the trial to establish treatment is effective. Now, I've been a bit cynical here myself. Again, you know, at something, at anything, just just show that it works. Um, you know, and again, this might be just because it's the cheapest way of running the trial, the most efficient way of getting the trial done and and successful. Um, and it's difficult with in in this example. It happens a lot when you've got a, a multifactorial outcome, multi-organ diseases. And the example I've got is um is lupus, which is a, a multi-organ um, disease with multiple impact on different aspects of quality of life. So what do we do about this? Well, we try and use those surrogates to predict, you know, something that's more patient relevant, clinical, clinician relevant, or decision maker relevant um, with, with external sources. Um, so again, this stack there is a quote um, from the, the case study I'll just quickly get into. But that's it literally was the genesis of of this um, this example that the endpoints were created for research and clinical trial purposes. So, what were the implications of of, of endpoints des designed for research and clinical trial purposes? So, these are all quotes from the public summary documents. Yeah, the, exactly, the, we started with this disconnect between the trial and clinical practice. The health economists try and close that gap with, you know, if you meet this endpoint, well, then chances are you'll meet more. You'll also meet more important endpoints like long-term survival, quality of life, organ damage. The key key point there, chances are, but we don't know. And so, in this circumstance, over a series of two years worth of considerations, um, ultimately not sufficient for the purposes of. Um, Funding and resource allocation, and a frolimab, similar, similar, um, similar drug. I think don't, don't honestly don't know, um, but similar patient population, if not exactly the same patient population, still a clinical need, no core outcome set. Twenty twenty three comes along, and a patient relevant trial outcome is evolving. I've just highlighted 2021 here because you know, this is now two years into the submission process and probably four or five years since the clinical trial was, was um, finished and, and or being recruited and, and the clinical community are, are looking at a new endpoint. Um, ultimately, at this point, PBAC considered that there was still limited data to populate the model. Another year rolls along and another submission but you can sort of see here it started building on that endpoint and we're starting to um, align clinical practice with clinical practice with clinical trial outcomes. There we're collecting evidence for this clinical trial endpoint and what it means for patients in terms of organ damage. Um, copy one of those is quality of life or something um, or flares. Sorry, flares was another one and, and mortality. And, also, and essentially, this ultimately finally allowed for a resource, a positive recommendation and, and um, associated allocation of, of resources. Um, the implications, I mean, the obvious implication for this one, which I wanted to bring out, is that, you know, this started in 2019 and no drug was listed for this condition until 2012, or recommended for listing until 2024. Um, would you know an early intervention and trial designed by someone like me or us stop this? Probably not. It was you know difficult um, multifactorial disease area. Those endpoints are difficult to measure, difficult to capture. It did take time to evolve, and that's why I sort of mentioned that 2021 paper. The beginnings of a clinically relevant endpoint really only started around about here. 
maybe we might have been able to reduce the five years a little bit, but don't think we would have stopped it. Well, I'm nearly there, sorry. I'll, um, you know, my wish list for a gold standard clinical trial, you know, at least 10,000 patients, you know, minimum inclusion and exclusion criteria, randomization, followed for 10 years without crossover, you know, nice, clinically relevant, homogenous primary endpoint and lots of quality of life resources data. So, you know, what's he telling me he's dreaming is exactly the, the point there. You know, if we could do that, we wouldn't have any issues with clinical trials, but I would say it's going to cost a lot of money, ethics considerations, so on and so on and so forth. Um, so, you know, we've got to pull back a little bit from that. Sample size that considers an endpoint beyond short term clinical goals, I don't think is un unreasonable. Um, inclusion criteria that are clinically, you know, we're not, we don't, we've got to move, get away from the skeptical part of the include the selective skeptical part and move more towards the decision making part on the inclusion. Exclusion criteria, who are the, who's going to use it in clinical practice, really? Um, the blue stuff I want to keep, you know, randomization between, you know, the intervention and current practice, no crossover, lots of quality of life data and, and good clinically relevant endpoints. So I've got the thumbs up there, but when I saw this, I think Dennis Denudo is the clinical trialist here saying that's, you know, still a bit of a big ask, Dom, you know, can't have, can't have everything. But again, maybe some of those principles are, are reasonable. So the the issue was, you know, addressing clinical trial designs earlier. And that, you know, I got to this part when I was putting it, if I met the brief and I don't think so, not really, not, not, they definitely haven't addressed the early part. We always tend to come in late, especially me in a reimbursement setting where we're coming in late. And, you know, I don't really know the answer to this question as to how, when, by whom a clinical trial is truly born. And, you know, I don't think that not a lot of them are born in Australia either. Um, and what my perspective is, and what I've talked about today is Australian um, reimbursement settings. Um, but should we have health economists in, in those rooms where they are born? I don't think it's unfair to say yes, definitely. We can add some value. Should we be the ones driving it? I would say probably not because we'd end up with trials like like this and and maybe we'd be a little bit too ambitious um, and and lose that scientific rigor of the clinical trial design because I've, I've been a bit flippant about it but it is a recurring theme and that's what clinical trials are designed for to show the treatment treatments work we don't want to get into a situation where the economics of treatment masks all that and and we lose lose the benefit of what the trial is doing well, um, and in that sense, like I say here, lots of economic decisions can be made without clinical trial controlled clinical trial evidence. We we as health economists we're a bit lucky to have controlled evidence. Um, transport economists don't have it a lot of the time, um, and infrastructure and so on and so forth. So maybe we can deal with it. But I would say we don't want to try to over, overstate the efficacy of how well we deal with these trial design issues. And if we can get to the bottom of them, you know, maybe we'd be better off for it. But, you know, like, like I said at the beginning, so maybe you haven't learned anything because we've come full circle. All there's all these issues require trade-offs and trial design, I think itself needs its own cost benefit analysis. And that's going to be the topic for um, the next seminar I've been told. And that's it. Thanks very much. Hopefully it didn't go too far. That's excellent. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dom. And I uh, particularly appreciate your sense of humour throughout this <laughs> whole process. Uh, look, I think a lot of the, you know, the issues, the challenges and the sort of thinking about this um, are probably common to many people on the line. And it's just, yeah, absolutely terrific to have them articulated so that we might, uh, you know, uh, be able to engage in this conversation with our colleagues, but also uh, help refine, develop methods, share, um, you know, issues and ideas. Okay, uh, now uh, the Q&A should be open. Vivian, if I can just have your um, acknowledgement that if we type something into the Q&A, that will come up on screen. There's nothing there yet. And yes. I did just try and test it out myself and I couldn't send the comments. So. Not sure if that needs to be turned on or whether that was just for me as a panelist. No, it's it's open. I can see it there. Um, and I right. do have a question asking 
uh, if the slide deck will be shared to the participants after this. So as long as Dom is comfortable with that, we can share those slides around. Yep, no problem. Terrific. Okay, so that that was an easy first question. Mm -hmm. uh, now, if uh, people online, and we've got quite a good audience, uh, like, you know, good in terms of quality and quantity, uh, if you'd like to raise your hand and uh, then hopefully we can see you, you can ask your question directly or put it into the Q&A. I'll just give people a moment to to gather their thoughts. Um, Dom, while that's while that's happening, um, I've got it's probably a bit more of a, a shared example or a comment mm. rather than a question for you, um, and it's about an experience with a crossover design uh, trial. Uh, so recently, um, at the at our centre, um, the clinical trial centre, we we're evaluating whether uh, prescribed cannabis was um, safe, effective, and ultimately cost effective for the treatment of chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting. And it was a placebo controlled trial with a crossover design. And uh, typically it was for all people who suffered nausea um, with chemo. So it was a range of different cancers. And the chemo cycles were generally three week cycles. So the trialists designed the study that for the first week or the first six days, um, uh, half the population would have the study drug, so the cannabis, the other part, the other half would have the placebo, and then the crossover, so day seven, so the next six or seven days, was the reverse. So the placebo got the drug, um, the people who were randomised to the drug got placebo, and then there was a third crossover, so week three, and that was patient preference, which is really interesting. And I can see why it worked well clinically, because um, they wanted to see whether, it, and it was about symptom relief, so stopping nausea and vomiting, but to see whether then people actually chose the study drug or did they choose mm. the placebo. So there was really useful information by having that third um, you know, the allocation. Mm -hmm. uh, the difficulty, of course, and, and what came what came out of it and has just been published now is that um, people did prefer the drug that turned out to be cannabis. Mm -hmm. um, but what that meant for the economic evaluation, so we wanted to do a within trial study, uh, is that we ended up doing picking the first cycle. And we just did a parallel comparison between six days of mm. A or six days of B. And, you know, we're hoping to then apply in a, in a further methodological work um, some, you know, similar statistical adjustments to the ones that you looked up, but also perhaps develop the work a little bit more with, re with relation to its effect on healthcare use. Mm. Um, because that might be a little bit different to, you know, statistical adjustments for, for clinical benefit in terms of stopping nausea. Mm -hmm. So it was just, it was another example. I think it brings up your point about um, you don't want to compromise the trial design if there's a really good rationale for, for mm -hmm. that design. And in this case, uh, I think there was. Um, and it's where, so so we were involved in, uh, probably not on, on day one, but certainly, you know, as the grant went mm -hmm. in, we were involved in discussing the trial design and we thought we'd just be able to apply some analytic techniques to sort mm -hmm. it out, you know, yeah. and we'll worry about that a little bit That's into it. the future. And then, you know, five, four years later, it then became, uh, it, this is, this is difficult to do. And I think we need at least a first output that just compares these shorter durations. So yeah, it was was an interesting um, did the four yeah, years application. Did it take four years because do you think the, the no it took four years because evidence. people weren't allowed to drive uh, on the study, so it was a re recruitment issue. Yeah. So uh, yeah. and also medical cannabis 
was becoming available through other routes and mm. people didn't want to go on the trial. Right. Um, so it was it was recruitment, but but then it did, you know, fully recruit. Uh, mm. It just took a bit longer and COVID, et cetera. Mm. Yeah, I just brought back this slide because you've obviously used this point here. You yes. Used the, six, the six days of evidence, un, uncompounded evidence that you did have. Yeah. And, and see where that see where that took you in terms of resource allocation, uh, resource use and quality of life. Yeah, yeah, which for a short term condition, you know, nausea rather than cancer, you know, progression mm -hmm. um, might be appropriate. Be right. Yeah. Yep. Uh, okay, are there any other questions or comments? Um, Vivian, I can't see any on Q and A. Perhaps uh, you can see them. No, I can't see any either. I thought I saw one come up. That's right. Uh, Lisa or Richard, do you have any questions for Dom? Rachel, I, I have a couple of thoughts, but there, there was a question uh, from Adele in the Q&A asking about uh, a, there being a problem with the hand raise, and she had a question to ask. Um, Adele, I, I don't know if you want to... Uh, Come off mute. Yeah, if you if you can talk. unmute yourself. Okay, uh, there we go. Yes, thank you. Yes, okay. right, number four. Yeah, because I couldn't unmute myself. Uh, thank you so much for for the talk. Just I just have a quite uh, more asking want to ask for uh, elaborating on uh, what do you recommend would be the best approach for collaborating to making sure that for the drug development we do consider um, bringing economists, health economists in. But I understand your point completely that you don't want to make a bias. But the reality is that um, I, I, I basically, I provide consultation and uh, for the drug development and the uh, biotech company, they do want to see a better rate mm -hmm. of success. Uh, so what is that recommendation from your perspective that without compromising the quality yeah. and um, the results, but still we are considering the realistic um, uh, maybe factors that we mm -hmm. need to consider in the design of the clinical trials? That is going to be used for the registration and the payback. Hmm. I just think the main it's a good good question, and I don't know the answer at all either. But the main thing I think is knowing that we exist, and that I think is that's that's changing. I was going to bring this up, but I didn't want to because I didn't have any hard evidence on it. But you know, when I started twenty five years ago, there was no multi attribute utility instruments in any clinical trial, and now I won't say most, but they're in a lot, and I think. That is because the health economists are be becoming more involved in, in clinical trials. So, I did, you're, you're right. I don't. I don't want us to ruin clinical trials. I want us to improve. When I say us health economists, I want us to yeah. improve clinical trials. So, definitely get us in the room, and that's 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 a matter of in big biotech companies is is knowing that we exist, and I would say making sure that we're not so busy because we're we're working hard at the back end trying to get drugs literally in, within the, within the sponsors world getting drugs listed that's obviously that's going to be take more of a priority at the back end because it's closer to the money quite frankly is the way it works but trying to drag them closer to to you guys um is, is procuring those resources within your organization i would say is, mm -hmm. is, the, is the main thing okay it's it's particularly important. So so we work, you know, a little bit more, not quite at the front end, but you know, sort of mm. uh, middle front, let's say, um, with investigator initiated trials mm. of um, you know being involved in helping. Uh, often it's around the time grants are submitted, you know, in terms of the the trial design. And one thing that comes up a lot is um, you know intermediate markers. So you've got an NHMRC grant; it goes for five years. You got to show something in five years. Mm -hmm. And um, for chronic conditions, that may be, um, you know, an intermediate endpoint. And so one of the things that I think we can do is, um, because we'll need to be creating a model, is ensuring that there is the budget in the final year of um, that trial to um, extrapolate um, 
and uh, try to look at associations between, for instance, quality adjusted survival and, you know, change in slowing progression of a disease, however it's measured. Um, and, and yeah, then that's interesting, really interesting work, um, you know, and takes a while to do. And it's sort of a separate piece of work to just an economic evaluation, uh, you know, requires often a bit of collaboration with, you know, epidemiologists or statisticians as well. But, but that sort of thing, I think, is, you know, is really important for us to acknowledge the constraints but to say, you know, within, for instance, a grant, let's let's build in some time for this to be done so that your data is going to be more policy relevant. Can I ask you, Rachel, on, on that, do you have to sort of show a return on investment for that? To, you know, you say, if we did this to the trial design and, and made that phase one 24 days instead of six days, in, in your cannabis example, perhaps, yep. Yep. you know, you'll that the, the data will be this much more better <laughs> this much more yeah look in practice so, sometimes mm -hmm. we do use value of information um mm -hmm. analysis uh techniques to say um you know if we if we had this sample size or if we mm -hmm. you know we, if we change the trial in some way um or more recently around stopping rules if we if we once a trial's underway if we stopped the trial at this point or um you know stop or go rules we continued particularly when we're starting to look at um trials with adaptations mm. uh, so sample size re-estimation which is sort of like you know crossover the crossover trial mm. issue on steroids yeah. um so we have we have done some exercises to do that but it's not um, part and parcel because actually even doing that takes a lot of time. Mm. Yeah. And, and I'd be really interested and, in, you know, maybe it will come up in the next session on the economics of, you know, of running trials is this sort of return on the, um, you know, additional time spent to get something that's perhaps a better design to, for reimbursement or to answer a policy question. Now, there is another question on the Q&A. Um, first of all, a comment saying, great talk, thanks, Dominic. Lots of interesting examples to show practically how initial trial design influences what happens at the other end, i.e. reimbursement decisions. And then there's a question around, what's the difference of the health economist roles between pharma and consultancy? Uh, I mean, in, in, in my job, I'm mainly working on, with, with pharma to help um, help them get their treatment reimbursed. So um, at, a, at a sort of a base level, I think, because we're focused only on the reimbursement part, well, my, my business is, we're, we're, we tend to specialise in, in this kind of work, whereas the people that work in pharma, um, probably probably less so. So we, we get a, a lot of experience and a lot of anecdotal type experience like you've, you've learned today that that within an individual organisation might not get so much. It's probably the main main difference. But that's different again from what Rachel does, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah. And, and consultants would probably be specific to the jurisdiction, whereas a, possibly a health economist in a, uh, a mm. company might be looking at things that have a more go global um, perspective i don't know or an fda perspective if that's the priority yeah, yeah, yeah definitely people that work in you know, regional centers yeah centers but not so much at pbac msec yeah those people are working yeah uh if there are no further questions uh i think it doesn't look like there are just check vivian there's no further questions that i can't see no, no more at this stage. Right. Okay. Uh, excellent. All right. Well, I think we might um, take this opportunity then to uh, thank Dominic very much for his presentation um, for, you know, raising lots of issues, talking about some of the approaches um, that he's undertaken and that others undertake and really looking at the reimbursement, you know, the, um, the funding allocation 
implications of uh, some of the trials and the designs that we work alongside. Um, I've really enjoyed it. And uh, so, you know, on behalf of Actor Heat, uh, Dominic, thank you very much. Um, our next webinar, uh, and just in terms of the dates there, I don't have it uh, close at hand, but it is about the economics of running trials. And 22nd of October. Excellent. Thank you. 20, 22nd of October. Um, and our presenter for this one is uh, Chris Schilling. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. So, uh, yes. So looking forward to seeing you all then. Uh, thanks very much. It's been really thanks. stimulating. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks, everyone.